Hello and welcome to Drugs Plus. Whether you're here for exam revision or just general interest, I hope you find this video useful. If you do, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for similar content coming soon. Today's video is part of my current series on therapies for type 2 diabetes, and this particular video focuses on dipeptidyl peptidase 4 or DPP4 inhibitors, or as they're also known, leptins. Islets of Langerhans are small patches of endocrine tissue in the human pancreas. They contain alpha cells, beta cells and delta cells, among others. When our gastrointestinal tracts are empty, usually in periods above three hours after a meal, alpha cells secrete glucagon. Glucagon acts in a wide range of tissues in the body, all with the aim of ensuring blood glucose concentrations don't get too low. These effects include inhibiting glucose uptake by bodily tissues, as well as the breakdown of storage molecules to generate glucose. However, when glucose is being absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract, usually shortly after a meal, beta cells are stimulated to secrete insulin. Additionally, glucose also stimulates enteroendocrine L cells to secrete GLP-1, which in turn increases glucose-dependent insulin secretion. As well as inhibiting the secretion of glucagon, and therefore inhibiting all of its effects, insulin acts in a large variety of tissues, all working to reduce blood glucose concentration. These effects include increasing glucose uptake into bodily tissues, as well as increasing the production of storage molecules. As you can see, these two hormones have opposing effect and together produce blood glucose homeostasis. However, in type 2 diabetes, the insulin arm of this process is diminished. This can be caused by dysfunctional beta cells resulting in, in reduced insulin secretion or reduced insulin sensitivity in peripheral tissues, or indeed both. The incidence of type 2 diabetes is rapidly increasing in all four countries of the UK, with 10% of the NHS's budget going towards tackling the condition. A more detailed description of type 2 diabetes can be found in my introduction video, which I'll provide the link for in the description box below. One family of drug that has been in development for almost 30 years to treat diabetes are the GLP-1 analogues. Arguably, the most important role of GLP-1 is increasing glucose-dependent insulin secretion. It does this by direct stimulation of GLP-1 receptors on pancreatic beta cells. But first, I'm going to show you the normal process of glucose-dependent insulin secretion and then how GLP-1 enhances this. So, when blood, glu when blood glucose concentration is elevated after a meal, glucose enters beta cells via glucose transporters. It then gets metabolized by glycolysis, the TCA cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation, producing ATP. This ATP binds to and blocks ATP-dependent potassium channels. This channel usually mediates a constant potassium efflux maintaining the cell's membrane potential. So when this is blocked, the cell becomes depolarized. This causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open, facilitating a calcium influx. This calcium works both directly and via secondary enzymes to stimulate the exocytotic release of insulin. That is the process of glucose-dependent insulin secretion. So on to GLP-1. GLP-1 is a protein synthesized from proglucagon in enteroendocrine L cells in the ileum and colon. When nutrients are absorbed in these areas of the gastrointestinal tract, GLP-1 is also released into the bloodstream. As the GLP-1 receptor is G-protein coupled, its activation mediates GTP to be exchanged for GTP. I will be uploading a video all about G-protein coupled receptors soon. This allows the alpha subunit to dissociate and activate adenylyl cyclase, which stimulates the production of cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A, which goes on to phosphorylate and inactivate ATP-dependent potassium channels. 
As in the previous slide, this causes the cell membrane to depolarise, which opens voltage-gated calcium channels. This causes a calcium influx, which mediates the exocytotic release of insulin. This insulin secretion is glucose dependent because it requires ATP for adenylocyclase activity. This is very important as sulfonylureas are now used far less often as they evoke insulin secretion that is independent to glucose levels. This is explained more clearly in my video on sulfonylureas which I will provide a link for in the description box below. Although this is arguably the most important effect of GLP-1, it has multiple secondary effects. More information on these can be found in my GLP-1 video, which I'll provide a link for below. So back to DPP-4. Physiologically, DPP-4 is a proteolytic enzyme which cleaves the first two amino acid residues from GLP-1, turning it into the inactive peptide GLP-1-330. However, this doesn't only reduce the levels of endogenous GLP-1, GLP-130 actually acts as a competitive antagonist at the GLP-1 receptor, decreasing even further the degree of GLP-1 receptor activation. Therefore, by inhibiting DPP-4 using gliptins, GLP-1 receptor activation will increase and consequently blood glucose concentrations will decrease. Gliptins available in the UK include citagliptin, bildagliptin, saxagliptin, linagliptin and allagliptin. However, there have been warnings that these drugs can increase the incidence of acute pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer. The FDA even sent out a warning regarding this in 2009. Additionally, they are thought to increase the risk of heart failure, leading to a 2016 FDA warning. DPP-4 is actually quite a promiscuous proteolytic enzyme and another polypeptide which is known to cleave and inactivate is atrial natriuretic peptide. Without its inhibition by DPP-4, its levels are believed to accumulate, explaining the increased risk of heart failure with these drugs. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it useful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I'll be back with more pharmacology videos soon.